Let's sing number 447 in our hymn book. 447.
want to welcome everyone back tonight to Tri-State Baptist Temple, and we're just, again, looking forward to another good time in the Lord's house, and uh, we've already had a great day this morning, and we're just uh, enjoying our music we've had today as it lifted up the Lord, and now we're looking forward to uh, the preaching of God's Word in just a little bit. Again, we just want to remind you about a few things. Next Sunday, we will have our adult uh, choir um, Christmas program, and so we're looking forward to that. We're going to have practice on Saturday at 6 o'clock. So if you're uh, in the choir and you weren't able to be here today before the service, just want to let you know we're going to have practice at 6 o'clock on Saturday. So we want to encourage you to be there. Uh, we'll have uh, uh, just a kind of a dress rehearsal and go through everything that's going to happen. And so uh, that'll be important, and we look forward to that. And then our children are over in the ministry center right now practice, having their last practice before their program on Wednesday. And so we want to invite everyone to be here on Wednesday. As our children will come and share their program, and it's going to be a blessing, and uh, uh, we just look forward to that as well. The Christmas uh, music recital then will be Sunday night, and that's for uh, children, for our teenagers, adults alike, for anyone who'd like to uh, participate in that. And I see we've got a lot of people already signed up for that, uh, and so we're, that is going to be exciting as well, and we just look forward to lifting up the Lord uh, during that uh, time. And if you'd still like to sign up and you haven't yet, it's laying right over here, and you can do that at the end of the service, and uh, we just look forward to that as well. And so... Uh, we're just looking forward again to the, all the wonderful things that the Lord has been doing, and we're just excited about uh, being able to serve Him. But we'll ask our men to come now. We'll take up Ty's offering of faith promise uh, for this evening. Amen. Let's pray. Amen. 
amen. Well, we say good evening as well, and on Sunday nights, we take up a little change offering, and we just ask folks, maybe if you have any change in your pocket, or in the bottom of your pocketbook, uh, to get that out and get it ready, and what we do with this offering is we put it aside, we've got this big plastic piggy bank over here, and uh, we take this, and we'll empty it out, and all of the money that goes into here goes to help pay for our church camp. And we have a church camp every summer, have it in the month of June, and uh, we take as many boys and girls as we can away to camp for a whole week. And we go out on a Monday, we don't come back on a Friday. Uh, we take out all children who will be going into the second grade all the way through the twelfth grade. And uh, we just have a great week out there at camp. We uh, eat three great meals a day, and we have two big services each day, and we have uh, competitions all week long. We divide up all of our campers into teams and they have competitions and compete in games and all kinds of things like that and swimming pool and paddle boats and fishing and uh, just all kinds of great things. They end up every night that we can, weather permitting, with a bonfire and a special service there. So it's just a great week and we encourage adults to go with us, families to go away, spend the week at camp and I promise you, you enjoy it. It'll be a great, great uh, week for you as well. And uh, all of the uh, adults that go always come back just as blessed and encouraged as the campers do. And uh, we'll be doing that again here in June. We'll have a deposit due on that here within the next few weeks. And uh, we'll have to have the money for that set aside. And so we hope that you'll just be a uh, blessing tonight. And the Lord will use you just to help with that offering. Normally have our little children, the boys and girls, take up that offering. But because they're practicing their Christmas program, we'll get our teenagers that are in the service. Or you uh, young people that are in here tonight, come on up and help me out, okay? I need your help. Appreciate you coming up and helping us. There we go. A few of you guys to come up here. There we go. At least get one pretty girl, so we'll get a little more that way. Boys, boys do all right, but need some, need some girl help up here too, so that's good. All right, we're going to pray together, and then what we'll do is we'll ask everybody to have some offering just to hold their hand up and hold it there until one of these young men or women come by and pick it up. They'll bring it back up here and put it away for us, and we appreciate everybody who gives tonight. But let's just pray and thank the Lord for the offering and ministry of our camp. God, we thank you for the opportunity we have to have a church camp. Thank you, Father, for uh, its impact in my life for so many years. And, Lord, we just thank you, Father, that we have an opportunity to uh, be involved in that and to have that for children in our community. Uh, Lord, that they can go away and experience camp, get away from the things of the world. And, Lord, for just a few days, they can just uh, be saturated with the truths of your word and be in an environment and in a place, Lord, where Christ is lifted up and exalted. And, uh, Lord, where our hearts, and uh, our hearts and minds just, Lord, think about those things that are important. And, uh, Lord, we just ask you to bless this year as, as we think ahead to our camp. Lord, help us today to lay aside that which we'll need to make that deposit. Bless the offering tonight. Multiply it. Make it, Lord, just uh, grow so that Lord, we'll have what we need as we move forward into this new year and get ready for camp. But we just ask you to just encourage uh, our young people here tonight. Thank you for every one of them. Lord, we pray you'd bless them. Lord, maybe there's a teenager that's come into this service tonight, but or they've never received you as their own personal Savior. Well, we pray they'll have ears to hear and a heart that will understand tonight the truths of your word. And Lord, we pray that each one of them will know you as their Savior, know what a joy it is to live for you and to serve you. And Lord, we'll just ask you again to bless tonight. Thank you for the offering in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you hold your hands up, they'll come by and they'll pick that up for us. And uh, be sure to get that put away. And we appreciate you tonight. <coughs> Thank you. 
Well, it's good to see everyone tonight. Appreciate folks coming out and being here. And we had a great uh, day this morning there, good services, and we're thankful for it. We're just looking forward now to spending some time together this evening as well. I'm excited now that Wednesday evening we'll begin uh, our program, special presentations, those kind of things. Christmas, of course, just a special time of the year. And, we're looking forward to it. Wednesday night, our youth program will begin at 7. Hope all of our adults will be here also just to encourage them and to be here to greet, welcome visitors that will be coming in to see the program. And uh, we just are looking forward to it. Please pray about that and just trust God. He'll speak to hearts and uh, bless our children and help them to do their very best for the Lord in our program. And then Sunday, we're looking forward to Sunday. It'll be a special day. We're going to have... Uh, uh, our adult choir and the program present their, uh, their uh, musical presentation in the morning services. They've got some young people that will be helping along with them and they'll be enacting some of the things that you'll be hearing them sing about and it'll just be a special morning for us uh, there on Sunday morning. Sunday night we'll have some special music and we'll have some, uh, some uh, people playing some instruments and playing some Christmassy songs as well as some special music also that will be given, some songs and folks that will be singing some special music. So it'll be a good night, and I'm thankful the Lord bless, has blessed our church with so much talent and things in that way that we can have something special like that. And uh, it's just a joy, and I appreciate folks who participate and help us out with that. So it's a good night to invite people to come and uh, be your guests for those services. But this evening, we'd like for you to please take your Bibles and open them back with us to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah is in the Old Testament, but it's often called the Bible in miniature. Isaiah has 66 chapters, and we know... Our Bible has 66 books, and uh, in the book of Isaiah, we find the great truths of the Lord Jesus Christ, that He's coming, that He was going to come. And uh, we know as we move to the New Testament, He did come. And uh, tonight, we're in Isaiah 53. This is one of the holy of holies of all the Scripture, and we're going to be looking at it again. And uh, tonight, we're going to be focusing on a verse, uh, verse 10, and the first phrase of that verse where it says it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Pleased the Lord to bruise him. But Isaiah chapter 53, and I hope as we read through this, and we have several times now as we've preached several messages from here, that these verses of Scripture begin to just find a place in your heart and in your mind that as we read along, they, they'll, uh, they'll find a, a place where they'll just remain there. And uh, what a blessing it would be to commit this entire chapter to memory so that we could draw from it uh, whenever maybe we're at work or on the road or wherever we may be. We can think about these great verses of Scripture. But Isaiah 53, the Bible says in the first verse, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. 
He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. In the morning service, we looked at the phrase that you found in verse 8, who shall declare his generation? That's the third question that God asked in this passage of Scripture. The first two were in verse number 1, who hath believed our report? The report that's given is the report of God, of how He sent His Son into this world to die as the Savior of mankind. And the second question was, to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? To whom is the arm of the Lord? The arm of the Lord, a phrase meaning the power of the Lord. The power of God is in the arm of the Lord. Who, who has seen the power of the Lord revealed? Well, if you're here tonight, you know that you're on your way to heaven. It's because of Jesus Christ, your Savior. And through Christ and Christ alone, you've seen the power of God revealed in your heart and life as you've received Him tonight. Trust Him for your eternal salvation. But tonight, we're going to look down here to verse number 10. There in that 8th verse, He said, Who shall declare His generation? And we know today that the redeemed of the Lord should say so if we have been. We should declare His work in this world. And down in verse number 10, this is one of the things that we need to declare. Is it pleased the Lord to bruise Him? It pleased the Lord to bruise Him. And that's what we're going to look at tonight here in Isaiah chapter 53. But let's pray together again. Well, we thank You in Jesus' name for Your goodness. And we thank You for Your grace. We thank You for the opportunity we have to be here tonight. Thank You for everyone in this service Lord, tonight, in a unique way, you've brought together this group of people. And Lord, for whatever reason, God, folks have chosen to be in this service tonight. And God, we pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the power of the Word of God, that their hearts and minds, Lord, tonight would receive truth. That Lord, those that are in darkness would be brought to the light. Those whose uh, eyes are blinded would be opened. Those who cannot hear would hear. And Lord, they would understand and know the truth that God, without you, we're lost. We're condemned sinners. Lord, we know that without you, we have no hope. And Lord, we pray tonight, they would see you lifted up on the cross of Calvary and as a living Savior tonight. And that, Lord, they'll realize that it is in you alone that they can find forgiveness of their sin and salvation. And so, Lord, we just commit that to you. Help us that know you as our Savior, Lord, to have our hearts changed by these truths. Lord, may the things we discuss tonight, Lord, may they just uh, grow deeper into our heart and life until the things we believe begin to affect the people that we are. And Lord, we pray that God will just have our lives changed and transformed by the power and by the work of your word. And we'll just ask God tonight now that you'd be glorified and we rely upon you and your Holy Spirit. And we'll thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. When you study through the Bible, there's an expression that you'll find when you come to the little book of Jude in the New Testament and the third verse. And the expression you'll find is is this. It's the faith. The faith. In that verse of Scripture, Jude 3, the Bible says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. This is one of those great verses, you know. The Bible is the greatest, test, uh, the greatest commentary on itself. It, it explains itself and reinforces itself and gives its own greatest evidence to its origin, being with God. Here's a verse of Scripture that testifies to the inspiration of the Bible. Because here's Jude sitting down with pen in hand and a piece of parchment, and he was going to write a letter, and the Holy Spirit of God moved on the scene. And instead of Jude and Jude's ideas being placed down on that paper, God used Jude as a human penman, changed his whole topic and everything he was going to write about. And here we have this thought that God wanted Jude to encourage the believers 
that they have to earnestly contend for the faith. The faith. This phrase, the faith. It has to do with the sum total of the doctrines and truths that we find in God's Word concerning our salvation. The faith. The faith. It, you know, it's what the Bible says about the saving of our souls. Uh, this faith should be, and it must be, contended for. This word contended means to exert oneself in the defense of, to, to go to combat for, to struggle for, to oppose error against. And God's word said we must earnestly contend for the faith. The faith. If we're going to contend for something, anything, but certainly this most important thing, the truth of salvation, we have to be familiar with it. And we must know what we believe. The Bible teaches about the faith and salvation. Every one of God's people, every one of us, if we know the Lord is our Savior, we ought to be able to take our Bibles and open them up and show people from the Scriptures what we believe about salvation. What are the distinctive doctrines and truths that define, that define the faith? What are they? And we ought to be able to know them. We ought to be able to take our Bibles and show them to people. In Isaiah chapter 53, this is the core of our faith. Our faith. The report given here is the report given by God. It's the report that God in the person of His Son, the Lord Jesus, being made man, came into the world. The world that He created he came into this world that had been ruined by his creation's sin, man's sin. And the souls of all men were separated from God because of their sin, sentenced to an eternity in the unquenchable fire of a place called hell. And God came as man and as a man, and yet God, and in his apparent weaknesses, he came, born as a babe and to a virgin. And we know into a poor earthly family, a family that had no influence in this world, they had no power in this world. The few out followers he gathered were outcasts of their society, most of them hated by the other members of their society. And he would, as only God could do, live a perfect and sinless life in this world. Christ lived a sinless life, a life that pleased the Father in every way. There was no sin in him, and so he did no sin. Verse 3 of Isaiah chapter 53 says he would be rejected in this world. Verse 4 said he would bear our griefs and he would carry our sorrows. Verse 5 says that he was wounded for us. Verse 6 said that God would lay upon him all our iniquity. Verse 7 said, through it all, never once did he open his mouth, and yet willingly and silently he surrendered his life on the cross for you, for me. How could that man, this Jesus, and what he did matter? And what could God possibly accomplish through the apparent waste of the life of this person named Jesus on the cross of Calvary? Well, it was through all of those things that the arm of the Lord's power was revealed. And what he accomplished through his son's life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection is no less than absolutely everything necessary to redeem and save the souls of men. That's what he accomplished. Verse number 10. Verse number 10 is one of the most baffling statements in the Bible. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. The him is his son, Jesus. The Lord the Lord God, the Father. It pleased the Lord God, the Father, to bruise the Son. The Bible said, He hath put Him to grief. It put Him to grief. What, what can we understand about this passage of Scripture and this phrase? Well, the first thing I want you to try to understand is when we hear this verse and read this verse, I want you to understand the compassion that we see in the death of the Son of God. The compassion that we see in the death of the Son of God. There's 1,189 chapters in your Bible. And this statement's got to be one of the most shocking of them to people who read and study the Bible. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. The phrase here, it means this. It means to wring all the life out of something. That's what it means. 
to take up something like a wet rag and wring it out till there's nothing left in it. That's what God the Father was pleased to do to His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to wring Him out until there wasn't anything left. In Acts chapter 2, the Bible says in that 23rd verse of Scripture, Him, the Lord Jesus, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. We believe the true God of the Bible is one God existing in three persons. And before the foundation of the world or before Adam was made, the entire Godhead agreed that God the Father would bruise His Son and put Him to grief. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 46, Jesus hanging on the cross said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In Psalm 22, the very same statement is made prophetically of the Lord before His death on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And I, Psalm 22, he, he goes on to, to say this in regard to that. He continues, he says, Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, and am not silent. And yet God did not respond, God did not react, God did not answer, but forsook His Son. He forsook Him. Why? Why? You know, in this world... A father who would deliberately forsake his own child or abandon his child. Or a father who would take pleasure in bruising his child or causing his child grief. We would think that we, that would be unthinkable. It would be, it would be intolerable for that to be allowed to take place in this world. And yet God did that. God did that to His Son. You know, many of God's people through the centuries and even today have suffered for the Lord Jesus Christ. They've suffered for His cause. They've suffered for the faith, for their testimony of their salvation. Many have faced death. Many throughout the ages have given their lives because they would not renounce their faith and would not renounce their trust in Christ alone as their Lord and Savior. The our history books and books such as Fox's Book of Martyrs record the faithfulness, though, of God to give them grace and to, and to strengthen them in the face of death and to comfort them. Some He delivered. Others, He gave them the, the grace and the strength to face death with an unwavering faith that caused many to wonder at them as they watched them enter eternity and go into the presence of the Lord and, the, and Savior, Jesus Christ. And you know, God the Father has promised that He'll never leave and He'll never forsake those that turn to Him and receive Him as their own Savior. But on the cross of Calvary, He did forsake His only Son. Why did He do that? John chapter 3, the 16th verse said, Because God so loved the world... And that's you. Yes. For God so loved you that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's why He did it. He did it for you. No one has ever done for you what God did for you in giving His Son, forsaking His Son. When we consider what God gave and what Christ was willing to do, there's not a one of us who know the Lord as our Savior, that, would, that ought to ever had to have to be prod or pleaded with or shamed into living for God and serving Him. And though sometimes it seems like that's all preachers do is try to prod and plead and beg and shame the people of God to live for the Lord and serve Him. It shouldn't be that way shouldn't be anything that would cause us to have to do that. We ought to want to give everything we are, everything we have to the Lord. Live for Him above all else and seek to fulfill the work that He died for simply because of who He is and what He's done for us. His compassion that He had 
when he gave himself on the cross. Isaac Watts, the hymn writer, in his song, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, he said, When I survey the wondrous cross upon which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss, and poor contempt on all my pride, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small, love so amazing, so divine, the man's my soul, my life, my all. And the Bible said it pleased God to bruise His Son that we might be saved and that we might have His ever-present Savior, Savior's presence in our heart and life and the promise that He'll never leave us and He'll never forsake us. The compassion we see in the death of the Savior. What He did, He did for you. When God forsook His Son, He forsook Him for you that you might be saved and that you might not be forsaken. But I want you to think of a second thing, the cause of his death. Isaiah 53, verse number 10, It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. You ought to mark that in your Bible. Making his soul an offering for sin. You know, the New Testament explains that very clearly. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, the Bible said, For He, and this verse of Scripture has all pronouns in it, so I hope you don't get confused. And Sometimes you ought to just write above the pronouns who, who it is that's being referred to because the Bible said, For He, that's God, hath made Him, that's Jesus, to be sin for us, and we understand that one, who knew no sin. The who there is the Lord Jesus, not us. He, God, hath made Him, Jesus, to be sin for us. He, Jesus, who knew no sin, who was perfect, sinless, always pleasing unto God the Father, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him, in the Lord Jesus. And you ought to... You ought to make reference of the part where it says that we might be made the righteousness of God. Do you know that things can't make themselves? They can't make themselves? Do you know that you can't make yourself righteous? You can't make yourself acceptable unto God? You can't make yourself who is born a sinner Separated from God without hope, you can't make yourself saved and acceptable and deserving of heaven. No, the Bible said we must be made His righteousness. There has to be an outside force applied to our lives if we're ever going to be saved and to uh, be made righteous enough that we're worthy and deserving of a home in heaven, that our sin might be, made, uh, might be forgiven. We must be made the righteousness of God. And we're made the righteousness of God when we accept Him, Jesus Christ, as our personal Savior. This is something only God can do. This is something God must do through each one of us, through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, because salvation is a personal thing. He died for you. He died for me. God bruised His Son and put Him to grief, and He made the Son of God's soul an offering for your sin, for your sin, for your transgression, for your iniquity. He made His Son's soul an offering. And God paid our sin debt by sending His perfect and sinless Son into this world and on the cross making Him our sin and then bruising Him and forsaking Him and putting Him to death that our debt might be paid in full and that we might be made righteous through faith in the Son of God. Salvation is absolutely essential for every one of us. It doesn't matter doesn't matter what kind of home you were born into, who your family members are, your grandparents. doesn't matter, uh, you know, uh, about your status in society. doesn't matter about what you have or have not of the things of this world. Every man, woman, boy, and girl must be saved because we're sinners. 
We needed a substitute to die in our place and to die our sin debt if we are to have hope of eternal life and forgiveness of sin. And God made Christ an offering for your sin. And the Bible said He saw His soul and was satisfied in the offering. And there isn't anything else that will satisfy God on your behalf but the soul and the blood of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the only thing that satisfies God. And here... Tonight, we want you to know that you need the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Have you ever asked God the Father to forgive you? There was a day when I had to ask Him to forgive me. Forgive me because it was my own sin that caused you to have to forsake your Son on the cross as He bore my sin on the cross. You poured your wrath out on Him instead of me. Would you forgive me for making you have to do that? And then I received Jesus Christ and what He did for me, His death, His burial, His resurrection, His life. I, I rested my soul in that. I rested in that. I'm not looking for anything else as my justification. Nothing else will make me acceptable unto God except Jesus. Have you ever done that? He died for you. God made His Son an offering for you. He bruised His Son for you that you might be saved. I want you to think about this last thought, the consequences of his death. I've been preaching now. This year was 20 years, so I'll be entering into 21 years of preaching next year. And with the wisdom of some older men in the ministry, I made up my mind when I began to preach that I would never leave the Son of God on the cross in a message. Amen. <laughs> you know, a lot of religions today, they depict Jesus still dead on the cross. He's not dead on the cross. He's not on the cross anymore. He's a living, resurrected Savior unto whom all power in heaven and earth has been given. And He has eternal life. And He's a living Savior. And when He was resurrected from the grave, He was resurrected and there were consequences of His resurrection. Death, sin, the grave... Hell, Satan, the flesh, the world, all of these became victims and he became the conqueror. He became the victor over all of those things. And there are so many things that he did. But here in Isaiah 53 verse 10, he shares with us the three great things that were accomplished through the consequences of his death and his resurrection. Notice what he said, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. The Bible said he shall see his seed. He shall see his seed. Now, when we speak about seed in the Bible, it's normally in reference to children. Your seed, the children that will come after you. Your children. You know, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ brought life. Brought life. We have physical life. But unless we're saved, our physical lives are going to end in eternal death. But the Lord Jesus Christ died. And through His death, we now have life. Real life. Eternal life. And life in this world. And His own resurrection and life and the promise of the resurrection and eternal life are a result of that for all who believe. We have that promise of eternal life. And we have that promise that though we must leave this world through the door of death, that someday we too, these physical bodies, will be resurrected. And they'll be made new again. And we'll live with Him forever. Over in John, the Gospel of John, the Lord Jesus gave an illustration. He said in John chapter 12, the 23rd verse, And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. What hour? The hour the Father would bruise Him. The hour the Father would make His soul an offering for sin. The hour had come. And He said in the 24th verse, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. That's an illustration of the Lord Jesus' death, His resurrection. I looked this up and you know, I, I've never taken the time to count it. You can do it and tell me if I'm right. <laughs> but an ear of corn, an average ear of corn, has nearly 800 little kernels on it. 
800 of those little kernels. And you know, if you've ever seen a dried ear of corn, you can take that dried ear of corn and with just a little bit of effort, those dried up kernels will just fall off. And then you'll have all those, all those kernels. They look dead, don't they? They're dead. You can't eat those dried up hard kernels. And uh, there's nothing there really of any benefit in that. You know what you can do? You can take seed corn, can't you? And you can take just a couple kernels of it and put them together and cover them back up. And God will send the rain and God will send the sunshine. And lying dormant within those dead kernels of corn is a spark of life just waiting to be quickened by the sun and by the, by the rain that will fall on it. Before long, out of that dead, dry kernel and ground will shoot forth a tender plant. And then that plant will grow into a stalk, able to bear upon it several ears of corn. And you can pick those ears of corn and shuck them down. And there'll be all those other kernels of corn, which you could take and dry out, apparently to the point where they're dead, yet you could plant them, and out of them will spring forth more life. Can you do the math on what one stalk of corn with 800 kernels on each ear could do if you just kept planting and planting and seeing that death turn to life again and again and again? I tell you, that's exactly what has happened ever since the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The seed went into that grave and came forth the third day and rose and bloomed into eternal, everlasting life. And now multitudes through the ages have received the, the, the Word of God and been watered through the Spirit of God. And, and the Son of God has shown Himself unto them. And one by one, they've burst forth into eternal life. The spark was there waiting to be quickened. It was dead, but it was quickened through the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now there is many seeds, many children of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible said it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. And when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. I read to you this morning Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 and 2 where it spoke about the Lord and as he faced the cross, the Bible said there of him that he faced that cross and with the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. What do you think that joy could possibly be? That he was willing to endure the cross, to be forsaken of the Father, bruised by the Father, made an offering for our sin. You know, I, I believe it was the fact that he knew that through his death, his burial, and his resurrection, he would see much seed. Many children born in glory. His children eternal children. Why? Because that's what he's always wanted. That's why he created man in the first place that he might be with him and dwell with him and live with him and be his God. And man ruined it all in sin. And yet it never left the heart of God that that's what he desired more than anything. And it pleased God to bruise his son that he might plant his son in death but rise from the grave in power and life and that many seeds might spring forth the children of God. Consequences of His death, His burial, His resurrection. But I believe there's another as well. The Bible goes on to say, He shall see a seed and He shall prolong His days. When He came out of the grave, He was a resurrected Savior. He had tasted death. He had gone through the way of the grave. He had, he had experienced our hell and yet none of them could hold him. None had claim upon him anymore. And he went through and came out the other side with eternal life, all-powerful life. The Bible says of him right now, Revelation 1.18, I am he that liveth, he says, and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. And he has a resurrected Savior today. And the Bible said that yes, the Lord bruised him and put him to grief, made his soul an offering for sin, but he shall prolong his days. 
And though he lived but a few short years in this world before he was plucked up in death and planted into the ground, he sprang forth that third day into eternal life and he lives today and lives forevermore as the ever-living Savior. Never again will death have any effect upon him nor his seed. None of us will ever face death. Death is separation from God. We've been saved from separation from God. Physical death is just merely an entrance into His presence. We'll never be separated from Him ever again. And He shall prolong His days. He shall see His seed. And then there's one third thing. He said, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. I think that's my favorite part of that whole verse. The pleasure of the Lord. Talking about God the Father. The pleasure. Can you imagine what God the Father takes pleasure in? What does He take pleasure in? I tell you what He doesn't take pleasure in. He doesn't take pleasure in one soul dying lost and entering eternity. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It does not please the Lord when men have to die lost and go and spend an eternity in hell for their sin. It grieves Him because He bruised His Son for you. He gave His Son as an offering for your sin. His Son's soul travailed that you might win the victory. And it doesn't please God the Father for a soul to go to hell. Tell you what pleases Him. It pleases Him when a sinner is saved. When a soul is saved. When His Son is glorified. That His death, His suffering, His blood was shed. Not in vain but in victory in the hearts and lives of men and women, boys and girls. It's what gives God the Father pleasure. And the Bible says that in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ, the pleasure of the Lord prospers. Prospers. Isn't that good? (laughs) The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many souls will be in heaven someday? I don't know. I don't know. I know. I know there's more than we think will be there. And yet I know that there will not be as many there as are going to spend an eternity in hell. There are so many on that broad way that lead to destruction. Many there be that find it, the Bible says. Oh, but there will be many souls in heaven. The work of the Lord prospers. The work of the Lord is victorious. The Lord will overcome. The Lord will conquer. And He is the conquering Savior. Revelation 5, verse 8, And when He had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof. For Thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by Thy blood. Listen, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. You understand? That means there's not a people group in the world where someone won't be in heaven. Every kindred, every race, every people, every tongue, the gospel, the gospel will prosper. Hey, listen, you teenagers, you young people here today, you know, I was preaching this morning on how we have to be willing sometimes as our Savior suffered in silence. There are times we just need to keep our mouths shut and silently suffer a little bit when we're reproached for the cause of Christ and silently just rejoice that we're counted worthy of being somehow connected with our Savior. (laughs) I tell you, it's happened a few times. I'm not talking about one time, but multiple times that I've gotten back criticism about our church and our ministries here. And this was the criticism. You're brainwashing people down there. You're brainwashing them. Talking about being missionaries and giving their life to go to the mission field and and serve God with their life. Telling people to throw their life away. You're brainwashing them down there. And you know, I've never said anything to anybody, but in my heart, I'm just silently saying, praise God. 
that that's what's happening here. Amen. That that's what's happening here. Man. And you young people, I'll tell you what, if I could and God would allow me, I'd want to give my life to Jesus and say, would you use me? You young men, would you let me be a preacher, a pastor, a missionary, or evangelist? You young ladies, would you let me be a preacher, pastor, missionary, evangelist, wife, or go to the mission field, serve God with my life? Because if you want to be involved in something that's going to be successful and going to prosper, you'll never be anything more successful or more prosperous than sharing the gospel with men and women, boys and girls. Because the pleasure of the Lord will prosper in His hand. In his hand. Oh, you say, well, what about maybe I labor all my life and only one person gets saved? <laughs> only one? Don't forget that God bruised his son for that one. Amen. Put him to grief for just that one. And eternity will be different because you let God use your life to lead that one soul to Jesus Christ. You can't be more successful than that. Nothing is more successful than allowing the Lord to use our hearts and lives. The pleasure of the Lord ultimately is to be with man that He created. That's what He wants. And sin wrecked that, but the Lord Jesus Christ has reconciled man and undone what sin had done and His work and His will will prosper now through His Son. And in the end, it's all about Jesus Christ being glorified being lifted up as the Savior that the Father was willing to bruise and to put to grief on our behalf that we might be saved. Let's pray together tonight. <clears throat> My heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Maybe somebody here tonight has come to church, but never in your life have you ever received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Never looked at the cross and through the Scripture seen Jesus suffering being forsaken of God the Father, being made your sin, dying your death, suffering in the way that you will suffer for eternity unless you are saved. Never been a time in your life when you ask God the Father with sincerity in your heart to forgive you for causing His Son to have to go through that for you. You say, I've never done it. In fact, I realized tonight, if I died, I'll have to pay my sin debt. I'll have to go to hell, suffer there. And the Bible said, unquenchable torment forever and forever and forever. But God loves you so much. He took the most precious thing He had in this world has ever seen, His perfect, sinless, obedient Son. And on that cross, He bruised Him wrung him out till there wasn't an ounce of life left in the Son of God. And he did that for you. And you've never received him as your Savior. Never. I tell you tonight, the Bible said we must be saved. We must be. And the time to be saved is when you realize you should be. Because that's when the Holy Spirit's speaking to you. The devil isn't going to tell you you need to be saved and accept Jesus as your Savior, but God will. And he loves you tonight. And he wants you to be saved. If you're here tonight and you say, I've never in my heart and life ever asked God to forgive my sin and save me, I'd like to take somebody, I'd like to have somebody take the Bible and show me what that means to be saved. I want to invite you right now. Nobody's looking but me, and I'm not going to embarrass you. But I want to invite you to come and let somebody take the Bible and show you from the Bible what you can do to be saved. How you can receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Won't you come right now? The Lord's speaking to your heart. You know that this is something you need to do. You need to come. Come now. Let us take the Bible and show you from the Scripture who Jesus Christ is and how you can be saved. And you hear and you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. We ought to want to live for Him. God bruised Him for you. He put Him to grief for you. Wrung Him out on the cross for you. And yet, 
we have to be prodded along and pled with and begged to make a commitment to serve the Lord and to be faithful to Him, to give for the work of the Lord through the local church. May the Lord help us that that never be the case from this day forward in our hearts and lives, but just because of who He is and what He's done for us, that we ought to be willing to give Him our all, everything we have. Give it to Him first. Let Him have it. That he can use it for what He died for, what He lives for. Let Him use our lives to prosper His work through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe somebody tonight wants to come, just slip out of your seat while folks are praying, and come forward and say, Lord, would you just use my life any way you want to, just use it. I may, I may be a housewife, I may work a job, I may be a student in school, and if that's what you want for my life, I'm satisfied to be the very best I can for you, but would you please use my life, would you just take it and use it? And God, if you have something else special for me, would you just let me know? I want to be obedient to you. Somebody tonight, just slip out of your seat and just come and find a place to pray and say, Lord, just take me, use me, whatever it is. I want you to have my life. You gave your life for me. We're going to pray together and then stand. And when we stand, it gives you a lot easier opportunity to slip out of that pew you're sitting in and to make your way and come. I pray you'll all be obedient to him. All of us will obey Him. If you need to be saved, I pray you'll come. Let us take the Bible and show you how you can trust Him. Father, we pray in Jesus' name now you have your way in the invitation. Lord, Your Word and the Holy Spirit, God, are what we rely upon and depend upon. I pray, God, we'll all do what we'll be glad that we did a million years from now. Help us to be obedient to You. Help the lost sinner to come and be saved. And God, all of us that know You as our Savior, to give you our lives and all that we are and have. We'll ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and take a hymn book. Turn to hymn 282. Hymn number 282. And as they get ready to sing that first stanza, we invite you to come. Maybe you're here tonight. You just need to slip out quietly and come. Find a place to pray. We invite you to do it. As we sing on the very first <coughs> verse of hymn 282. <coughs> in just a moment the third verse just as I am though tossed about with many conflicts and many doubts and I hope today that you have no doubt about who the Lord Jesus Christ is and what he's done for you I have, hope you have no doubt that if you'll come to him tonight no matter how much turmoil is going on in your own heart and life don't have any doubt he's waiting to speak to you and meet with you in your own heart save your soul, give you eternal life, and uh, use your life in this world. Don't have any doubt about it. And uh, we hope tonight when we sing this third verse that you'll just allow the Lord to do what he wants to do in your heart, in your life. Let's look at that third verse and sing that verse together as well. <clears throat> Let's 
just finish with the last verse, verse 5. Just as I sure to invite everyone back on Wednesday evening to see our children's program and I just want to invite you tonight not to leave the service after the service is over if in your heart you know that you did not do what you felt in your heart you should do uh, please stay and I will find a place where we can sit down and speak to you from God's Word uh, or find uh, one of our other folks who'd be willing to do that and uh, they'll help you tonight through the Bible to know what it is that is needed in your heart and in your life. So we invite you to do that. Tonight's our business meeting night, so we're going to dismiss our service and then reconvene just a few moments to just take care of some things that we need to here as we uh, are in our last business meeting of the year. And uh, we we'll, won't take long tonight, but do need to take care of some things before we finish. But it's been good to be here today. God bless you for coming out. It's good to see a uh, great group of folks out on a Sunday evening, and uh, just a blessing. And I hope you'll just invite people to come and be with you. So let's pray together this evening, and we're just going to uh, have a final word of prayer together. And just pray that God will just encourage, bless each other, and help one another, and look to Him. Uh, Brother Eric, just dismiss us in prayer, please.